I'm Tommy. Nice to meet you, Tommy. I'm Catherine. When Kimberly chose to leave, Catherine was the only choice. Catherine assumed the Pink Ranger power, and just in time, we were under attack. Oh yeah, and there was that period where time kind of reversed and we all became children and a bunch of aliens took over for us and Aisha remained behind in Africa in the past except she became a teenager again when time was restored and her family moved over to Africa too and then this girl named Tanya joined us and, well, I guess all of that wasn't important. Also, Kimberly dumped me. Welcome, my friends, to Power Rangers Dino Thunder. The season begins with the two-parter Day of the Dino. In a flashback, we see this mysterious martial arts expert escaping from an island as it explodes around him, chased by the Stingwingers as demonic cousins. Yes, it's Tommy, who jumps into the water to avoid the blue screen explosion. According to Jason David Frank, he returned to the series as a favor to Doug Sloan, who told him that the ratings were in decline. Several years later, we see him entering Reefside High School and become a science professor. We also meet Cassidy, a reporter for the school's TV show, and Devin, her bumbling cameraman. Tommy notices a kid in the class is missing, which would be Connor McKnight, who's practicing soccer instead of going to classes. When his goalie asks about them getting in trouble for this, our wise and future Red Ranger has this to say. Don't worry about Randall. She's a woman. And women are just growing up girls. Need I say more? I think you've said quite enough, Mr. McKnight. Principal Randall. I have heard such great things about you. Vicious rumors, I can assure you. We also meet Ethan, the local nerd, or at least this show's interpretation of a nerd, and Kira, the resident guitar player and woman who needs to learn that you don't need to apply 15 layers of makeup to your face. The three are given a week's detention and Tommy the task of watching the three as he goes to a museum outside of town. He sends them off on a wild goose chase while he investigates, discovering that the museum's now under management of Anton Mercer Industries, something he says is impossible. The three fall into a giant sinkhole and a CGI T-Rex chases after Tommy. Tommy, being a badass, roundhouse kicks the thing, but to no avail. You know, Tommy's got to be having deja vu right now. The three wander around a cave while the T-Rex smashes into a road, revealing it to be a robot. Man, serious deja vu. The teens discover the entrance to a hidden laboratory and three gems in the center of the room. They each take one as they start to glow. By the way, the three have all been bickering with one another. It does a good job of establishing characterization, though it does get kind of grating after a while. The three run off as the foot soldiers of the season chase after them, Kira suddenly becoming Black Canary thanks to her gem. Kira displays some martial arts prowess while Ethan's skin suddenly becomes super strong and rock hard. Connor gains super speed and they fight off the foot soldiers. This is the first real season to display what's known as civilian powers. They were technically present in Ninja Storm as well, but I wrote that off for the fact that, well, they were using magical ninja powers anyway, so it didn't really count. This season, though, there's no excuse. I do not like civilian powers at all. Part of the idea of Power Rangers is that they morph in order to gain superpowers to fight evil. That while they might be good fighters as civilians, the powers make them... Well, powerful. Civilian powers cheapen the morphing, making it seem like the suits are just an afterthought. They really have no purpose but to add special effects to unmorphed fights. 
except we don't want special effects in unmorphed fights. Those fights are supposed to show our heroes kicking ass with martial arts. The next day, Kira gives up her gem to the others, saying she doesn't want anything to do with this. Cassidy says that there's something odd about Tommy, especially after she called Angel Grove High and they wouldn't give her any information about him. I mean, seriously, I called Angel Grove High and they wouldn't tell me anything. It's like his private records are some big secret. Yeah, I kind of thought that was why they called them private records. She equally becomes suspicious when she sees the three teens talking to each other, since the three are from different cliques and have never taken a glance at each other. Why do I get this weird feeling that Cassidy was supposed to be on the set of Bratz the movie but got lost and ended up here? Anyway, Kira gets kidnapped by the foot soldiers and the other two decide to head to Dr. Oliver's house. And how exactly does Ethan just search on his phone for Tommy's address? The two enter his house and Connor starts playing with his stuff. Hey, remember what happened last time you did that? Dude, the guy's a teacher. Not Well, Tommy's gone through four other costume changes, so why not Batman, too? The two end up back in the lab. Tommy explains that the creatures that took Kira were called Tyranodrones. And you know that because I helped create them. Oh, class project? It's a long story. Our main villain makes his presence known to Kira, who seems to take the dinosaur man rather well. The villain, Mesagog, is apparently very stealthy since he keeps teleporting behind Kira. We also meet his henchwoman. You kind of look familiar. My master calls me Elsa. Your master? Man, Mesagog's into some kinky stuff. Kira actually manages to fight off Elsa, though she seems more surprised by her ability to fight than anything else. A portal suddenly opens up and she escapes through it. Tommy explains that the Tyranodrones weren't meant to be used the way they are, that a few years back he was researching ways of fusing dinosaur DNA and technology. Okay, Tommy, seriously, what purpose does that kind of research serve unless you plan to become a supervillain with an army of cyborg T-Rexes? He was working with a scientist named Anton Mercer, who vanished just before their laboratory was attacked by Mesagog. Kira lands on top of their car, and Tommy explains that she went through an Invisiportal, which was completely visible, so the name makes no sense. Oh, and sadly, we still have the stock music from Ninja Storm. You sure about that? The four fight the monster and the Tyranodrones. A little trivia note on Tommy's fighting. Longtime fans of the show know that Tommy likes to say his little fighting, Aya! And see! Aya! Well, apparently Disney didn't know that and passed on a memo to him asking him to stop swearing during the fight scenes. The forces retreat and Mesagog starts planning an assault on Reefside. Launch your aerial assault. The citizens of Reefside will think that idiot Lothor has returned to town. Ha! Huh, I like Mesagog already. The next day, the city is engulfed in darkness as Mesagog releases Biozords to attack the city. The teens go to Tommy and they all head to his lab, where he explains that he helped build them as well. Tommy further says that the three need to tame the Biozords to stop them. Ever since I found the Dino Gems, I've had these waiting, in case I ever needed to harness their powers. Into what? Dinomorphers. Use these to become Power Rangers. I gotta sit down. Breathe, dude. We can't be Power Rangers. Aren't you supposed to fly or have superhuman strength and stuff like that? You do. Oh yeah, I forgot. Your gems are from the asteroid that crashed into Earth millions of years ago, wiping out the entire dinosaur population. Oh goody, they gained their abilities from the power of extinction and genocide. He says the gems chose them and have already bonded with them, but that Mesagog need only destroy them to steal the power of the gems. The three take the morphers. So now what? Do we need some kind of secret password or command? All you have to do is say Dino Thunder, power up, and you'll be transformed. You'll know what to do. Dino Thunder. What, did you come up with that? I kind of like it. You would. Look. I know you three are from different worlds, I get it. But you're gonna have to work together or this will never happen. This won't be easy. Nobody knows that better than I do. But you're gonna have to believe in yourselves. Because I believe in you. Really? Really. He takes them to the Biozords as Zeltrax appears. You don't have to get past me before you get those swords. That's the part I'm looking forward to. You guys ready? Oh yeah. Ready, ready!
The three have their first morphed fight and with Tommy's guidance manage to repel Zeltrax, but he takes to the skies in a big ass ship while the Rangers take control of the Zords. Only one more thing to do. Bring them together. You can do it. Okay, let's do it! Yeah! yeah. yeah. The Thundersaurus Megazord doesn't exactly have a great first outing, but it does destroy Zeltrax's ship. The Megazord itself is pretty damn good, though the joining sequence is really too fast in my opinion. Mesagog torments his servants for their failure. Meanwhile, the Rangers are given bracelets that simultaneously function as communicators and will access their morphers when they need to. You think Mesagog's gonna stick around for a while? Unfortunately, they always do. They? I know this is a lot to take in. That's for sure. Your lives have just changed in ways you probably couldn't have imagined. But as long as you work together, and remember, you're a team. No one can defeat you. No one. Day of the Dino is a pretty good start to the season, both for longtime fans and for new viewers. Tommy evolving into the role of mentor was a great idea given his popularity among old viewers, and any new viewers of the show would be intrigued by the mysteries about him. It does suffer some issues, pacing, acting, and off-kilter dialogue, but not to any excess. The fight scenes are pretty dang good, with some good fight banter here and there. The team is once again made of teenagers, and they actually feel like teenagers, save for being stuck in very stereotypical personalities. Then again, that's how the show began, and with Tommy back, one could say they're back to basics. Now I know what many of you are wondering. Where the heck are Tommy's Zeo powers? He used them in Forever Red, so why doesn't he use them now, especially since my Ranger teamwork philosophy bullcrap is in effect when he has a new team of Rangers? There are any number of explanations, but the most popular that I've seen is that Tommy drained the power of his part of the Zeo crystal in order to help forge the Dino Gems. Otherwise, it's likely that Tommy's Morpher is in storage somewhere, and he could still Still assume those powers at some point, but for the moment there's no need, especially as we'll see in the next few episodes. Next we're introduced to Haley, Tommy's confidant and assistant, who's also responsible for creating the Dino Morphers. Speaking of supporting cast, even Mesagog's generals seem to fare better here. Sure, they're toadies, but they're actually convincing as evil despite random makeup lines and bizarre hairdos on Elsa. Am I to understand that you feel no need? to explain yourself. Lord Mesagog, it is in my humble opinion that it would be a waste of your valuable time. Time better spent destroying Dr. Oliver and his new Power Rangers. Exactly the answer I was looking for. Tommy also has some digi-eggs that grow into the team's motorcycles. By the by, I'm not really that fond of the Dino Ranger costumes. The helmets are good, but overall the outfits are just kind of bleh to me. The central symbol just seems like the goofy emblems the toys and movies stuck on the original Rangers outfits, and the white areas down the sides don't match up when the central colors of the outfit are now on the symbol, that being black and gold. Most uniforms are a good balance of white and the primary colors, unless they're doing something different with the designs, like with Ninja Storm's gray gray areas, or a wild force having that strap along their chests. This seems to have the opposite problem that the Lost Galaxy uniforms had. Too much color and not enough white. At Haley's Cafe, we also meet Trent, who starts working there as a waiter, but is also an aspiring artist. Kira, naturally as the only girl in the group, crushes on him instantly. Yeah, I'm real sure Trent will be important this season. I mean, I might as well just start calling him Richie. Mesagog's method of creating monsters is a genetic randomizer that creates a mutation. Following that, the monster is hydrated by Mesagog to grow. I love the Dino Thunder theme song. It did take a few listens to finally let it catch on, but it's got a strong rock rhythm, and I really wish there was more incidental music using bits of this instead of recycling the stock music from Ninja Storm. 
At the end of the third episode, Tommy is kidnapped by Mesagog, leading into the 500th episode. Naturally, for a series that has lasted 500 episodes, a massive achievement, especially for a kids show, they go all out, do everything they can to make the episode special, and the most exciting 22 minutes of television ever made in, yeah, it's a clip show, though with the awesome title of Legacy of Power. While Messagog holds Tommy prisoner, Haley and the Rangers go through Tommy's video journal of Power Rangers history as he's been chronicling the group for years. Since it's very abridged, there's a lot missing. Tanya isn't mentioned at all, and after Lost Galaxy, he stops listing off all the individual members. Cole doesn't even get actually shown in civilian footage. Wild Force's segment is all of three sentences. Here's what I don't get. As I said, the post-production team in New Zealand wasn't in the best of shape, so you can understand why they had difficulty with new footage they shot. But how exactly do you screw up the audio of old episodes? Rangers, the power of the Zeo Crystal now resides within you. It will bestow upon you powers beyond your imagination. In a cute bit, Connor says that his twin brother went to the Wind Ninja Academy, a reference to the fact that Connor's actor was one of those three we saw at the end of Ninja Storm. So much for the secret Ninja Academies, I guess. I also love how Tommy says in the narration that it was the Thunder Rangers that gave them their biggest challenge, further proving how worthless Lothor was as a villain. We learn that Mesagog's goal is to return Earth to its prehistoric roots and restore dinosaurs as the supreme beings of Earth. Why can't you just want to rule the Earth like all the other sickos? The three utilize an Invisiportal to get to Mesagog's fortress. They, of course, run into some trouble on the way, but following the Carter Grayson school of ranger tactics, they mostly shoot their way through while pulling off a damn impressive action scene. The rangers demorph for some reason and rescue Tommy, proceeding to morph again to pad out the episode. Tommy takes a crystal that Messagog wanted him to unlock, tricking Zeltrax into breaking it out of its shell. Inside of the crystal is a black dino gem, allowing him the power of invisibility. And thus... Aren't you a little old for this, Tommy? I may be old, but I can still pull it off. Dino Thunder! Power up! It's of course cool to see Tommy as a ranger again, but I have to admit, I think it's too early in the season once again. It would be a lot better if this had happened a fourth of the way in, like the sixth ranger usually is. I know, I know, limited by the Sentai footage, but I still have to comment on this from a story perspective. There isn't an established status quo for this series yet, and it's already changing things up. Anyway, Tommy Zord is the Brachiozord, which is a big carrier Zord for the other three. To make matters better, it even comes with another little Zord called the Cephalozord, which can link up with the Thundersaurus Megazord as a new arm, like in Wild Force. Well, I better get going. Going? Where are you going? Shopping. I checked my closet this morning, and there's a serious shortage of black in there. In the following episode, the elusive Anton Mercer finally makes an appearance, much to Tommy's shock. Anton is actually Trent's adoptive father, who took him in after his parents died in a cave-in. Tommy says that their experiments have taken on some weird directions, but Anton is strangely aloof about the whole thing. Anton tells Trent that Tommy is a part of his life that he's put behind him and doesn't wish to talk any more about it. Zeltrax, during his fight with Tommy, says that they have a score to settle, though Tommy doesn't know what he's talking about. Trent discovers an invisible portal in his home that causes him to worry that his father is involved in something not on the level. Meanwhile, the Rangers discover and tame a Dimetrozord, providing another arm attachment to the Megazord. However, the main advancement of the storyline comes in the three-parter White Thunder. Anton isn't supportive of Trent's artwork, so he's been coming to Haley's before it opens to work on his art. Wow. This is... You did this? Yeah. This is really good. 
Uh, not really. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's okay. But Haley makes it sound like he's working on the flippin' Mona Lisa. Elsa, in the meanwhile, discovers a dino gem and takes it before Tommy can get to it. During a conversation between Trent and his father, he starts to get disoriented and sweaty. When Trent leaves, he enters an Invisiportal, though Trent sees it. Trent enters the portal and is transported to Mesagog's fortress. While there, he finds the white dino gem, which attaches itself to him. He somehow gets out of the fortress and flees, the dino gem forcing him to morph. Elsa later reveals that this particular gem is pure evil. Pure evil? Pure evil. They send out a monster to fight it, but when the rangers go to confront the monster, the White Ranger destroys it and reveals himself to the rangers. He walks through them with little to no effort, par for the course for evil rangers by this point. Tommy eventually joins them, but they're all thoroughly defeated. Later, the White Ranger stumbles around and demorphs, with Trent apparently not remembering what happened. In part two, the White Ranger has awoken again and is activating a dino egg to release his zord. When this opens, there will only be one color left in the rainbow. Well, if you want to be technical about it, white isn't really a color in the rainbow. When Trent shows up to work, he's half dead and Haley orders him to go home after he collapses. The rangers discover two dino eggs, one of which is the White Rangers, and they go out to find them. Trent collapses in the street and becomes the White Ranger again, continuing his work on the egg. Connor and Kira try to fight him, but he once again kicks their asses. Meanwhile, Ethan and Tommy track down the other egg, which has already hatched into the Parasaur Zord. The Parasaur is another arm attachment that's essentially giant scissors. Tommy stays behind to go deal with the White Ranger, but Zeltrax intercepts him. After a fierce battle, Zeltrax retreats, but the delay allows the egg to hatch, unleashing the Drago Zord. I was unaware that dragons were dinosaurs. Tommy unleashes a Stegosaurus Zord that he got in a filler to try to help them, but the White Ranger takes control of it, merging it with the Dragozord to form his own Megazord. The new Megazord launches a huge-ass spear at them, splitting it up. Before he can take control of the other Zords, Tommy reclaims control of the Stegosaurus. The White Ranger retreats and brutally demorphs. The three are demoralized, but Tommy says these are the kinds of days they can potentially have, and tells them to get some R&R. &R. The three want to keep fighting, but he makes it an order. Enjoy yourselves now, because this is only going to get worse. At a soccer game, Connor spots Trent on a bench and offers to help him, but Trent refuses and walks off. Connor chases after him, but then is attacked by the White Ranger. After a tough battle, it seems like the White Ranger is victorious, but Connor suddenly stands tall, goes into his rather silly-looking Super Dino mode, and blasts him back hard. Before the White Ranger can finish off Connor, though, Mesagog shows up to offer the White Ranger a chance to join him. The White Ranger refuses and goes off, stealing the Stegazord again. Might as well call it the Yo-Yo Zord. Tommy returns to the warehouse where he ran into the White Ranger earlier to recover some equipment, only to see it's been taken by the White Ranger. He finds Trent, who has forcibly morphed into the White Ranger and fights Tommy. Before Tommy can warn Haley of what he's found, the White Ranger encases him in some kind of amber. Following White Thunder, Trent starts to recover some more of his memories of what's happening. He quits the cafe, but won't explain why. Elsa and Zeltrax are sent to take the White Ranger by force, but the two are easily taken down. The other Rangers show up, but the three are easily defeated once again. However, when the White Ranger gets a closer look at Kira, he can't fight her. The White Ranger retreats for the moment. Kira goes to visit Trent, who reveals to her that he's the White Ranger. Kira goes to get the others, but Elsa has found him too, sending out the Tyranodrones to capture him. Ethan and Connor don't think he can be trusted. Mesagog recognizes him as Anton Mercer's son, and tries to get Trent to join him once again, but Trent morphs and escapes. He summons his Megazord, and the Rangers prepare to fight, though Connor tells Kira on no uncertain terms that they have to do whatever it takes to stop Trent. Haley also reveals yet another new dinosaur, the Ankylosaurid. As the new Zords are wont to do, it becomes a new arm, a combined drill and shield arm. Later, Trent talks to Kira again, saying it's too late for anyone to help him, that the gem has taken over. He tosses aside his sketchbook and leaves, telling Kira he's got to leave to prevent himself from hurting anyone. Following that, there's a filler involving a meteor that unlocks recessive personality traits with whoever comes in contact with it. However, at the end, Haley manages to use the radiation from the meteor to free Tommy from the amber. However, once he's freed, he finds that he can't demorph. 
Behind the scenes, this occurred because he worked out a deal with the producers that allowed him to go home and visit his family while shooting 10 episodes, only doing voiceovers during them. After another attack by Trent, two more of the auxiliary zords are captured by him. Connor and Ethan are against helping Trent, but Tommy tells them that he was in a similar position to Trent once, and they shouldn't give up on him. The White Dino Gem has assumed full control over Trent, meaning that even when he's demorphed, it's the White Ranger that's talking. To throw another wrench into matters, at the end of Burning at Both Ends, Messagog reverts into Anton Mercer, and in the next episode, we learn that it's a Jekyll and Hyde relationship. While looking through old photos, oh, and I'd be insane not to include this bit. Wow. Nice hair. Hey, it was in style back then. Kira and Tommy discover an old picture of him first joining up with Anton Mercer, where he also met a guy named Terrence Smith, or Smitty. Terrence was up for the same job as Tommy with Mercer Industries, but Tommy was the one who got it. Terrence went on to work for another company, but was apparently killed in an accident. Naturally, it turns out that Zeltrax is Terrence Smith. I was on the verge of a breakthrough. When it all went wrong... Mesogog found me and put me back together again. He's a genius with cybernetic reconstruction. I'm still not sure what exactly the revenge is that he wants, though. Just because he didn't get the job with Mercer's company? That part wasn't even brought up when he explained his backstory. Anyway, Zeltrax had made a deal with Trent that if Trent helped him to get Tommy, Zeltrax would help take down Mesagog. However, Zeltrax is loyal to Mesagog and informs him of the plan immediately, allowing Mesagog to once again offer him the chance to join him. This time, Trent accepts, partially because it seems the White Ranger's personality is merging with him, so there's a mixture of both present. Zeltrax also reveals that he's kind of got a thing for Elsa. There is an episode that I'm sure people want me to comment on, and that's Lost and Found in Translation. The three teens, while watching TV, discover a version of Power Rangers made in Japan. In actuality, it's a badly dubbed version of Abba Ranger, the Sentai Dino Thunder is based on. Though from what I've read, not a very accurate one. It was made as a humorous nod and wink to Sentai, with Connor blasting it because it's not American, and that he sees it as Japan making fun of both their country and their efforts. But Kira and Ethan are getting into the fun spirit of it. By the end, Connor is turned around on it, and he ends up loving it. It's weird to watch, to say the least, but it's a good lesson for purists from either side of Power Rangers vs. Sentai. See, their show is different, but it was still cool. Anyway, after that, Zeltrax and Trent battle for the position of second-in-command, with Trent winning through. Later, Mercer tells his son that he's worried about what the Dino Gem has done to him and explains his backstory. You know, my research on dinosaur DNA was bold, it was groundbreaking. I was sure I was on the verge of a whole new technology. One that would serve the betterment of mankind. Which is why you decided to drink it. Through a series of events, Zeltrax frames Trent for the destruction of some of Mesagog's experiments. As a result, Mesagog ties down Trent and tries to kill him. However, Mercer's personality breaks through and redirects the beam meant to kill him. It bounces off everything and hits the Dino Gem, shattering the coating that created the personality while keeping the power itself active. Yep, his father has freed him from the White Ranger personality. Mercer tells his son to use it however he sees fit, but mostly he should help the Rangers, since otherwise there's no chance he'll be free of Mesagog. However, Trent promises that he won't reveal the secret. Which, I've gotta say, is the dumbest thing he can do, since now the Rangers won't pull their punches if they ever go up against Mesagog directly. Trent unlocks his own Super Dino mode, which looks especially silly, though I do like the Katars he has. After Trent saves his life, Tommy allows him to join them. However, at the end of the episode, it's revealed that Zeltrax saved the Monster of the Day's weapon, a copying device that allows him to create a duplicate of the White Ranger, except with no trace of Trent within him. The copy retains control of the Dragazord and the Stegazord. 
Later, Trent and Tommy go out to uncover an ancient artifact called the Shield of Triumph. Connor comes to help, and Tommy explains that only someone in sync with the universal dino energy can retrieve it. The Rangers all contribute to the power, allowing Connor's form to upgrade into the Triassic Ranger. The downside is that the Triassic Ranger needs the other Rangers to contribute their energy to do it, demorphing them. At least for two episodes before they find a way around it, so what was even the point? Along with the Triassic powers, Haley invents a new assault vehicle for Connor to pilot. During the vehicle's trial run, Zeltrax and Tommy enter into a final battle aboard Mesagog's ship. Tommy, deciding to end the feud once and for all, destroys him along with the ship. Well, that was an anticlimactic end to all that. The episode itself where it happened was a Kira-focused episode. The vehicle can also become the Mesodon Megazord, once again adding to the Rangers' arsenal, and in turn combining more of the Zords to create the Triceramax Megazord. You may have noticed that I haven't commented very much on Cassidy and Devon. Some people like to compare them to Bulk and Skull, but there really is no comparison. Bulk and Skull, when they began, were bullies and didn't care about school, and as a result, their antics made a little bit more sense. Cassidy is just a selfish idiot because... she wants to be a reporter? Devon, on the other hand, while a little clumsy and absent-minded, is intelligent and skilled. Frankly, I don't understand why he's practically Cassidy's slave unless he has a crush on her, but even that will only go so far considering the lengths he goes for her. It should be noted that with a lot of these seasons, the Sentai is still going on at the same time as the Power Rangers version is being written. As such, the writers don't know what they're going to be able to use with the Sentai footage or where the Sentai footage is going. Subsequently, when the Abba Ranger equivalent of the Triassic Ranger was brought up, it was believed that he was actually a sixth Ranger for the team, and there were some plans made for Devin to become the Triassic Ranger, but they dropped it when it was clear that it was just a powered-up Red Ranger. Anyway, Cassidy deliberately puts herself in harm's way on foolish and moronic errands just to get an exclusive story, interrupting the Rangers in the middle of a fight to try to get an interview. Hell, she once ignores the closed sign on Haley's Cafe for completely vapid reasons that rely on other people actually being there. Even though since the place is closed, logically no one would be there for her. However, as time goes on, Kira gets a job as an intern for a TV station, and Ethan, after accidentally hooking up with Cassidy for a blind date, actually befriends her. Through the mutual acquaintance, Kira manages to land Cassidy a reporting story or two for the station, and she's thankful to Kira for it. So afterwards, she remains shallow, but has a few deeper levels to her, and, well, makes her nicer. I just wouldn't compare the two to Bulk and Skull, is all. After ten episodes of staying morphed, Tommy discovers a slime that they use to finally demorph him. However, the effect of it kicks in his Dino Gem power and turns him invisible. You know, come to think of it, 10 episodes is the equivalent of, like, at least several days, if not a few weeks. So how is he able to eat? Maybe he could take off his helmet, but then why didn't he ever take it off while the others were around? Anyway, this part is resolved in the episode Fighting Spirit. Haley believes she's found a way to bring Tommy back to normal, but doesn't have a proper power source. Tommy suggests using his Dino Gem, but Haley is reluctant since it may be too powerful. When they try it, it overloads the system, shatters his Dino Gem, and knocks him into a coma. Still, he's visible again, so it did do what it was supposed to do. While the Rangers head off to deal with a powerful monster, Tommy is taken to a hospital. Inside Tommy's mind, however... Hello? Anybody? What is this place? Hello, Tommy. Remember me? 